Our next presentation, the largest known prime numbers. And I bet that some of you already figured out some strange things at the back somewhere there. And there is even a small, I don't know, piece of glass that you need to use to watch actually the prime numbers. So, how many prime numbers do you know? <laughs> I, uh, I've been an entrepreneur all my life. My first venture was a mathematics academy, and I think that I still remember how to do square roots manually. That gives you an idea how old am I. And uh, then we knew how to memorize prime numbers until, probably until 1,000, and even convinced kids of 12 years old to memorize that. So let's see what Rob comes out with that. <laughs> well, you need to, done? Oh. <laughs> Um, so I'm, I'm uh, Rob Giltrap. Um Some of you may know me from my early days involvement in the uh, Willy Lug. I kept it running for a few years in early 2000, uh, founding member of the New Zealand Open Source Society. Um, and uh, I also work for Sun Microsystems as a uh, systems and storage architect. Uh, but this discussion is really about my hobby rather than my job. Uh, and that hobby is searching for uh, the world's largest prime numbers. And um, to do that, I've used a lot of some technology, and we'll get into that. So what I'm going to cover here is a quick look at, at GIMP's project, which is the project involved in searching for these large prime numbers. Uh, then the Lucas Lemma primarily, uh, primality test, which is the, the, you know, the real problem we're trying to, to, to solve. Uh, the code, the application to do and resolve the problem, the uh, tools I used, and then uh, the parallelization effort. Um, and that was really because once I got hold of the code, uh, though it was designed to run in a parallel uh, manner, um, it hadn't actually been coded as such yet. So the, the GIMS project is, is basically the, the great internet messing prime search. It is a distributed computing uh, project. There's six, uh, roughly 60,000 computers out there which are actively uh, doing searches for these pr large prime numbers. Um, there's about 35,000 registered users and about 260,000 actual computers registered, but only about 60,000 of them actually uh, are actively giving results. Um, and it's you know, not, a, not a bad sort of supercomputer putting out 40 tera teraflops uh, on average, and that's, that's slowly increasing over time. Uh, the project has found a bunch of uh, Mersenne prime numbers, and uh, I'll tell you exactly what these are. Uh, for those who don't know, Mersenne prime is a specific type of prime. It's basically where 2 to the power of a prime number minus 1 uh, is also a prime number. That is called a Mersenne prime. They're very rare, um, but they're quite interesting in terms of really you know, getting into the large number space. Um, also have correlations to perfect numbers as well. For every Mersenne prime, there is a, a correlation to a, a perfect number. Uh, and they've been around a, a hell of a long time. Um, first documented in 5th century BC, um, quite a lot was written about them by Euclid in 300 BC. Um, but, you know, the first two were found in the 5th century, the next two were found in the 4th century, and then there was a pretty big gap after that, uh, through the Dark Ages before we got to number 5. Um, so there's only uh, 12 discovered for the uh, advent of computer processing, 
And um, if you can see, there's a sort of thing down the back there where I've got the, uh, the largest one known before computer processing, the largest one involved with computer, computer processing but before distributed computing, and then the largest one which is with the assistance of distributed computing. That one, uh, the number's very, very large and you actually need a little, micro, a little um, thing to look through to actually see the digits. So, uh, but I urge you to take a look because it's quite interesting. So there's now 47 that have been discovered. Um, the, the name Mercian Prime comes from this guy, Marin Mercian, who was a French monk. Um, pretty interesting character. Actually, his, uh, the fact that his name got associated to the Mercian Primes is bizarre because he really didn't do that much about with them. Uh, and there's plenty of other people whose names could have been associated with them. Um, he's actually more famously known for being the father of acoustics. He did a lot of the uh, initial maths around uh, chord structures, so for everyone who you know, plays the guitar, you've got a lot, of, lot, a lot to thank uh, this guy in terms of understanding the science behind how uh, acoustics work. Um, but the thing I found most interesting researching him was that he was what I consider, you know, semantic web version, <laughs> the very first, first alpha version. He would go out and uh, write to all the scientists throughout Europe and say, give me some information on what you're working on. I'm going to be doing this to lots and lots of other people. And when I find bits which they've got of interest, which you may be of interest in, I will forward it on between you all. Not only that, um, he would translate it. So um, he would have a little team of his fellow monks who, who were fairly educated and, and, and spoke a variety of languages. And they would go out gathering bits of data from the scientific web out there taking it in, working what was relevant to other parties, translating it, pushing it out again. Uh, so, yeah. <laughs> um, a, a, a fantastic guy, and it's just like, wow, what could have he achieved in today's, today's society with the technology available to us today? So, um, back to the actual problem we're trying to solve, and that is saying, okay, well, how do we just find these large prime numbers? Well, we, we, we know a lot of the smaller prime numbers. Um, we know them all sequentially, so we can just take one and do the process, two to the power of P minus one, is that a prime? Well, how do you actually work that out? Well, you can do old school maths and say, let's just divide it by every sort of odd number um, up to the square of, square of the total number, but that will take forever. Um, it's actually the first bit we do. We do go through that process to rule out some of the things, so we take the large number, divide it by three, you know, is that uh, wholly divisible, yes or no, if it a prime, is it potentially a prime, yes or no? But the real uh, way of doing it is using the, the lucas Lehmer test, which is here. Now, um, for those of you who didn't do too well at maths, um, it's actually a fairly simple equation with a little bit of research, fairly simple to understand. Uh, and the key part of it is <laughs> the squaring. Computational wise, uh, it's the squaring which takes the time. Um, trouble is when you're doing squaring really large numbers, it's extremely problematic. So we use what we call a fast Fourier transform. Now the maths involved in that is actually really, really hard and way above my head. Fortunately I don't need to understand it to get the code running fast. So, and uh, the person I deal with uh, is this guy Ernst Mayer, he's uh, in California, um, really interesting guy, he um, uh, mathematician, um, understands the whole maths behind it really well, but he also works for various companies doing CPU design. Um, so he's got sort of the best of both worlds and knows how to write a program to get the most out of CPU and vice versa. Um, there are three main programs out there which do, do this work, and that is Prime95M Prime is the, the one which the general populace use to just say, you know, I'll download it on my, onto my computer, it'll go get a number, it'll start processing it, you know, six, eight weeks later, months later, it'll return a result. That um, runs on Windows and Linux um, and is primarily written, the, the core of the code is written in uh, Assembler to, to really get the um, speed and um, you know, runs just on Intel AMD x86 platforms. Um, G Lucas is a uh, written in C and it's can obviously being written in C it's more 
it can run on various platforms. Um, key design there is that it's uh, fine-grained threading, and then M. Lucas is the one which I've been working on, uh, and that is more of a uh, coarse-grained threading model. Now, the reason why people don't just use the top one is that that is, doesn't scale very well in terms of uh, parallelism. Um, so most people run, you know, they may run, if they've got a quad-core machine, they'll run four individual processes, um, each doing one number, rather than trying to take one number and carve it up because it doesn't perform too well. Where the others are much better, more better handling parallelism. Um, so it uses a custom FFT. Um, there's lots of um, optimised FFT libraries out there all wonderful, but when you're talking about the numbers, the, the size of the numbers we're dealing with, which is in the range of you know, 12, 13 million digits long, um, uh, they just don't cut the mustard. So you've really got to have a specialised one. Uh, it's pure C, and we're starting to throw in a little bit of assembler uh, in there, assembly, um, and that's just through prefetch and the like. Um, trouble is, now to really get performance, you've got to go to another layer, and with the, certainly with the x86, you've got to start using um, ECC2 uh, directly um, to really get the uh, performance out of it. So, but this was originally designed for non-x86, so for your alphas and your sparks and, and those those systems which did have you know the potential to have lots of CPUs in them. Um, and the goal for it was really to have the fastest verification code. So that was. What happens is when these 60,000 computers are going out there finding primes and they're all processing one, and you know, about every 18 months one comes up and says, oh, I think I've got one. Uh, an email goes out to about half a dozen people around the world, I'm one of them, and we all race to try and verify this, this new find as quickly as possible. Given that you know, the PCs, the fast PC will process one number in about six to eight weeks, um, people don't want to wait around that long, so, so we, we, throw, we try and throw something a bit quicker at it. To uh, get the results. So, being that I work for Sun uh, and Solaris and Sun, oh, you know, high levels of parallelism. It's just you know that's the ecosystem we work in. Um, I thought, great. Well, I'm in a perfect position to take this code and uh, see what I can do with it. Um, this is my hobby, and just my job gave me access, uh, either officially or unofficially, to, to, to resources within the company. Um, and there's certain, certainly plenty of uh, other people in the company who are interested in this sort of things, which uh, were willing to help me out. Uh, in fact, plenty of senior managers were quite happy to say, hey, this is cool. <laughs> Here's a multi-million dollar box, have a play for a while. Um, so at some we got a bunch of hardware, um, which is really great, lots of, uh, lots, lots of cores in it. Um, we've got Solaris, over Solaris, and that is synonymous with you know high levels of parallelism. Um, and Sun Studio, which is uh, something I've never played with before having to do this. It's not part of my job at all. So on the hardware, we thought, right, well, where do we start? You know, what, what, what sort of hardware is going to be able to handle this highly parallelized workload well? Um, and we got things like the AMD Opteron, which uh, at the time was sort of ahead of uh, Intel in terms of their high-end uh, high CPU. Um, and that sort of box is, uh, you know, today you've got uh, eight, eight CPUs, six cores per CPU, 48 cores, you know, plenty of juice there. Ultraspark T-Series, um, that's really interesting. That's a cool thread technology, um, lots of slow threads. Um, and you can get a box now which has got four processors, Eight cores per processor, eight threads per, per core. So you're talking um, you know, 256 uh, threads in a, in a box. Uh, and then you've got the traditional old big iron um, with the uh, Spark 64 processors. You can get a couple of racks, bolt them together, uh, 128 processors, four cores per processor, f two threads. So you're talking about five, to five, twelve threads in a box. Massive throughput. I think it's uh, three quarters of a terabyte per second. Terabyte per second between two boxes bolted together. Um, fantastic memory. Uh, you know, terabyte of memory sort of size. Sorry, um, I have the first prime number. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's a unitary number. <laughs> we can argue about that. <laughs> How am I going for time? 
So, uh, so we had plenty of hardware options to play with. Uh, and then uh, Solaris. Well, Solaris, you know, I'm, 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 a, I'm a Linux guy just as much as an expert, but when it comes to scalability, I can't really go past Solaris. Um, just from the, the history which is had, I mean, um, you had your large ETNK boxes with 64 processors, you know, a decade ago. There, it's, it's an operating system which is used to and familiar having uh, a lot of threads available to it. Um, it's not something you have to sort of add on to, so it's actually uh, a little bit easier on occasion to use this instead of, instead of Linux. Um, though, you know, very, very similar. Um, particularly with, when you're using this many cores, the operating system, you really just wanted to get it out of the way. Um, not try and consume, not try and do anything too smart. Um, benefit of Solaris consistent across all the hardware platforms, so we have multiple types of chips, but, you know, we're all just planning for one, one operating system. Um, the memory placement option of it is, is very, very good, um, and that was a key, you know, it was a necessity um, for Solaris to be able to place memory more optimally because it was designed to be running on larger systems. It wasn't an add-on, it was just a, uh, a core function. Um, observes, observability of, of Solaris is very good with D-Trace and resource control, being able to turn off threads, turn off cores, doing stuff very, very nice. Now, Sun Studio. Um, we are running out of time. Am I? I'm, I'm very, very close to it. Okay. So, um, Sun Studio, it's part of the Sun ecosystem, and the Sun ecosystem is threads, 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 um, and there's lots of tools which you can use to um, use it. So, the parallelization effort um, had to, um, had, had, had the software design, but it had the, uh, the high access to the hardware. The, the tools to do it, but not the time to actually take that code and properly parallelize it, put in the OpenMP, do all the testing. So we got a Google Summer of Code project up and running, got a guy to do it for me, fantastic, did a brilliant job. Um, can't say enough about the uh, the guy who did the work. And we got some... Oops. Skip a lot there. Um, so some of the tools, Sun Studio, thread performance. This is a situation where we had uh, four threads going full, full out and the other one just only kicking in every so often. The tools which are available with Sun Studio are um, really, really good for analysing your, your problems. Uh, Arndale's law is absolutely key. What we found is that we, when a single threaded process, we basically had a transform square, transform carry, uh, as you start doing the first three bits, you know, when you're only talking about two-core machine, not that much difference. But when you're talking 16 threads, the bit which isn't parallelized suddenly becomes a really big bottleneck. Um, so we've got some challenges, big numbers, um, lots of uh, hardware options, so lots of testing, and compilers can be broken. I've broken Sun Studio compiler three times using this, uh, simply because we're pushing it to the edge of what's needed. Uh, our end result was um, 2.3 times, 12.3 uh, times performance for 16 threads, which is pretty damn good. Um, in fact, we got when we used four, four cores, we actually got a more than four times increase due to the cache effect. Um, and the end result was that we did, we were now the fastest code for verifying primes. And back in 2008, we 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 were the first to validate a uh, prime, the first one over 10 million digits, which was um, uh, worth a $100,000 prize. So there's some useful links that will go up on the website. And now I challenge now, taking it to, we re could really only effectively work at 16 threads, want to take that to 40, um, prepare for 100 million digits, much bigger problem. And then it takes two years to process it. The 160 meg working set, we try to fit everything in cache. Um, and finally, James will be keen to know that we are going to leverage Nehalem EX. It's proving to be an extremely powerful processor uh, using the GLucas code. It's just taking us a while to get it going with the MLucas code. So, uh, Thanks, Rob, and good luck. Thank you. <laughs>